program here in the College of Architecture and Planning. We're fortunate tonight in having a speaker that uh, had to get up, unfortunately, awfully early this morning in California, some uh, three or four o'clock, and trek all this way across the country in order to be here in time to give his talk this evening. Uh, we're fortunate in having Dr. Donald W. Aitken speaking with us tonight. This uh, presentation is sponsored jointly by the College of Architecture and Planning and the Energy Center for reasons that I think will become evident as uh, Don proceeds with his talk. Don is a former research physicist from Stanford University. In 1970, he left that university and went to San Jose State University and founded the Department of Environmental Studies and the Center for Solar Energy Applications, which he now directs. In 77, the students at that university named him Professor of the Year. During the last two years of the Carter administration, Don was the director of the Department of Energy's Western Regional Solar Energy Center, which was called Western Sun. And he had the responsibility for administering the federally supported solar commercialization programs throughout 13 Western states. After doing that, he returned to San Jose and he's continued to teach there ever since. He's lectured internationally and he enjoys a very special relationship with the Taliesin Foundation. He continues as a technical consultant to the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. He is working with them on a number of projects that you'll hear about tonight. And he has been hired by various owners or stewards of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, a specific example being Johnson Wax in Racine, Wisconsin, to provide the technical consultancy necessary to bring the building back to its original condition at the time that Wright designed and built it. He has served as uh, chairman of the American Solar Energy Society. He was invited to be a member of the American Solar American Society of Mechanical Engineers because of his contributions to the engineering professions. And he remains a member of the Illuminating Engineering Society and the Association for Professional Energy Managers. Don has a very unique relation with Taliesin for many reasons, not only his technical consultancy, but also by virtue of the fact that he married the daughter of one of Wright's clients. And through that relationship developed his early involvement with Frank Lloyd Wright. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Donald Leitkin. Good. Thank you very much. I, I get great pleasure in talking to architectural audiences and when I'm not introduced quite that way, um, the assumption is usually made that I'm an architect. So people will talk to me later on as though I'm an architect. And somewhere in the discussion, I have to tell them I'm really not. I'm a physicist. But I've had quite a, quite a number of years in my relationship, especially to Frank Lloyd Wright and my love for architecture. And I think the distinction about what you are gets rather muddied when you get deeply involved in, in various areas. It happens as a physicist that I think in terms of energy flow, and I always have. So when I teach the principles of ecology, for example, I teach in terms of energy flow of living systems. When I look at buildings, I find I can imagine the energy flow in a building. And when I help as a technical consultant in doing energy efficient buildings, it's obviously from a standpoint of utilizing the natural energy flow in buildings rather than having furnaces and air conditioners fight, fight the climate and all of this. None of that explains very well my reverence for Frank Lloyd Wright or my awe for Frank Lloyd Wright. We were talking about this at supper a little bit. And I said, perhaps it's not at all uh, unreasonable to say that you pursue a cause out of reverence and out of awe. I don't really have to stand up and objectively defend my great interest in Wright. I had the privilege of knowing him personally until he died for five years. I met him in 1954 and knew him until 1959. So I knew him as the man, but the man continues to live in his works. Now the particular area and where I seem to have found myself, um, my relationship with Taliesin has been as the energy designer for their buildings since 1976. But what I'm doing now, I'm a daylighting design of Frank Lloyd Wright, 
It's quite a different term. What's happened in the decade of the 80s, as I'm sure you've all seen, has been a great resurgence of interest in uh, daylighting. Daylighting of commercial buildings, especially. We've had two international conferences in 1983 and 1986, both well attended. 500 people from 40 nations in the last one. We've had um, a great interest being shown in developing uh, daylighting design tools, many articles written about daylighting, and some rather spectacular daylight buildings are now appearing. Um, along with that has been some scholarship and um, maybe a, a late recognition, but still a recognition of some of the pioneers, the architects for, from quite a while ago, who have contributed spectacularly. And in particular, we've been reading a great deal about Alvar Aalto, and we've been reading and hearing a great deal about Kahn, Louis Kahn, and there are others. But we've not been hearing about Frank Lloyd Wright. And I found myself wondering why. And I think I came up with two answers, and I think it was because of the answers that I was stimulated to start the work that I'll be showing you tonight. And much of this is the first time tonight. I'm on sabbatical doing this work now. Um, the answer to the question stimulated this. One of the answers is that Alvar Aalto and Kahn both studiously approached their daylighting designs. We have beautiful drawings, ray diagrams, just showing under different solar positions and angles just what the sun would be doing. What we're doing, we're developing the daylighting characteristics of our design, and it made it very easy to do scholarship. Wright did none of that. There aren't any ray diagrams. There aren't models. There are models of some of his buildings, but there are not daylighting models. Um, to do scholarship on Wright, you have to look at the buildings and let the buildings speak for themselves. And that's hard, because you can't express that in the same scholarly um, kind of ways. Well, it became more and more evident to me that Wright, in fact, was a giant among historical daylighting designers. Wright himself would talk reverentially about um, glass, this wonderful material that was so beautiful in its nothingness because it would give us the transition between the inside and outside. It would let the light float through. Wright would um, also wrote in glowing terms about the sun and the importance of sunlight coming in, the importance of living within your buildings in sunlight in order to, to be healthy psychologically as well as biologically. And so he made it very clear in his own writings that daylight, sunlight, the connection between the inside and the outside were very important criteria. But he never told anybody how he went about his design. And he couldn't have any more than Mozart did. Wright did his designs in his head. He evolved an entire concept. And as I'll show you in a couple of examples, he basically could go from the earlier sketch to the finished concept with very, very little change. I believe, as I said a moment ago, that Wright is a giant among historical daylighting designers. I further believe that he has contributed in several ways. And so I, I used a title for this talk. Do you give it the legacy talk title? I tried experimentally at the Passive Solar Conference in Portland, where Bob heard an earlier, smaller version of this, to title it the legacy, the daylighting legacy of Frank Lloyd Wright. And that puts me on kind of um, thin ice. There are several aspects that you've got to prove if you're going to say that there's a real legacy. Uh, for example, are there specific buildings that modern daylighting designers have been copying or emulating? All right, then that would be a day, uh, legacy. <coughs> or alternatively, you want to look for techniques that Wright pioneered and that people are now using the same techniques, perhaps consciously emulating, perhaps not consciously. All right. There would be even a third ingredient to what I would call a legacy, and that would be the future. If, in fact, you could see that Wright had ideas and techniques for daylighting design that people are only now getting sophisticated enough to begin to use if you're not Frank Lloyd Wright. I believe I found evidence of all three. But the only way I can um, verify this at all is to let the building speak for themselves. And in some cases, in the pictures I'm going to show you, I've put in some of our conventional daylighting diagrams. Daylight bouncing off of a shelf or a surface or shading or something like that. 
to take you from the classroom, the kinds of things you're getting in the classroom, to Wright's building. Tonight, for the first time, I've assembled these in a two-projector sequence so that we can begin to see some of these back to back. I finished putting this together last night at 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, as I told Bob, if you're invited to give a talk three weeks later, it, it has a sort of wonderful sharpening effect in your mind. I'm doing tonight what I expected to do at the end of my sabbatical, not the beginning. So in fact, these are reasonably uh, preliminary, but I think a number of themes and ideas are, are coming through in the pictures. Let's see, figure this out. <coughs> I like to show this pair. The picture on the right I took last week. I've seen the bust done by Eloise Swabach, now Eloise Krista Atelius, and I've seen that bust there for 30 years, 25 years, and only last week happened to walk into the living room in Talias and West, and the sunlight was filtering down beautifully through the, the uh, translucent roof and some pictures I'll show you later, and I thought, my goodness, that's the way I really ought to show Frank Lloyd Wright in the start of, of our discussions. Well, in order to develop this idea of, of a legacy, there are some things we need to look for. So let's see what kinds of things we might be looking for. For example, can we turn to the Lockheed building on the right, which was designed in 1983, built in 84 and 85, and is now one of the nation's most famous energy efficient and specifically daylit buildings. And can we find features in that Lockheed building that we could trace back to Frank Lloyd Wright's Larkin building done in 1904, 80 years earlier? Let's go inside. The Lockheed building is organized around a central light court. The Lightrium, as they call it, although it's an atrium, top lit. On the left, 80 years earlier, you've got what Frank Lloyd Wright called the great light court of the Larkin building. Well, let's look a little bit further. On the right-hand side, you've got the sloping roof in Lockheed that was carefully worked out by a computer in order to get the daylight to penetrate farther into uh, Lockheed. And you've got, of course, the daylighting bouncing off the light shelves on in. On the left-hand side, you have a picture of the drafting room at Talias and West in Arizona with a similarly sloping roof. Again, that's just about the same picture on the left of Taliesin, and now you notice that the roof itself is the daylighting resource. At Taliesin, it's a translucent roof that lets 1% of the sunlight through, so 8,000 foot candles becomes about 100 foot candles uniformly throughout the space. And we're beginning to find in other buildings more and more the use of the cow wall type walls and so on. The idea that you don't necessarily need buildings, the building walls themselves can become your daylighting resources. Is there a conscious connection with these, or is there an accidental connection? We've got a <clears throat> interesting new hotel vernacular that's happening everywhere now. The top-lit atrium in the hotel, and in some cases specifically designed so that sunlight can spot down in that. To what extent do we owe that to Frank Lloyd Wright's spectacular top-lighting approaches, such as in the Guggenheim Museum? I'll return and address that specifically in the talk as we go on. We're always seeking ways in order to get daylight in buildings and deep daylight penetration is one of the most difficult design tasks we have. So the split envelope is one approach, the right hand building being a kind of typical split envelope to split the building in two, bring daylight in so you can bring it in from both sides. On the left we have the Marin County Civic Center by Frank Lloyd Wright, a split envelope building. Do we have something to learn from Wright's approach to split envelope or have we learned? We have a different approach toward daylighting the interior of a hotel. This is specifically sunlighting the interior of a hotel. And now on the right-hand side, which happens to be the, the Meridian Hotel in Singapore, and the other one was the Mandarin Hotel in Singapore. I just came back from Singapore. You're seeing pictures that I've been taking recently and I put together yesterday because they seem to fit. Um, more and more consciously, you're seeing an attempt to bring sunlighting and plants, a quality of the outside, into the interior. And on the left-hand side, we have the great um, open light court done by Frank Lloyd Wright for the Rogers Lacey Hotel, a design he did in 1946 that was never built. But 
to what extent are these new designs now picking up on what Wright was trying to demonstrate that we should do? Well, I think the best way we might be able to trace this, excuse me, I forgot this as well, in the workplace. More and more, we have the spectacular workplaces now where we're not just daylighting, but we're sunlighting. You can get the experience of the outside when you're inside. To what extent has that realization, no, to what extent has been the importance of the realization that when you're in a building, if you can see something moving, if you can see the day change, if you can have a sense of the sun, that it helps just your whole attitude, your whole sense of well-being. To what extent do we owe that to some of Frank Lloyd Wright's great workplaces? For example, the Johnson Wax Great Work Room, as it's called on the left-hand side. What I'm going to do starting here now is to go back to the beginning and to trace step by step some of the things Mr. Wright has been doing and pretty much let you, I guess, draw your own conclusions as whether this is legacy or not. And if you don't draw those conclusions, at least share with me the awe with which he did understand this topic. On the right-hand side is Frank Lloyd Wright's first home, which he built in 1885, in uh, 1889, in Oak Park, Illinois. On the left-hand side is Frank Lloyd Wright when he was the age that he built the home. He was 23 years old. He had a growing family. He needed to have a, a, a growing size home. He borrowed $5,000 from his employer, Louis Sullivan, and he built the house on the right. But that didn't really last very long in terms of providing him with enough space. And so in 1895, he added the dining room and the playroom addition. And then in 1898, he decided to come back and work out of his home, and he added the studio. And each of these, we find an evolution from the home to the dining room to the studio. We're fortunate that there's been some wonderful restoration work done. So the pictures on the right show the restored um, home and studio by the Home and Studio Foundation in Oak Park, Illinois. Well, we look at this drawing, for example, and it's sort of interesting. It shows various shapes and so on. And all of a sudden, we begin to find some usual, unusual things already. We find unusual angles with windows at different angles with splayed walls rather than right-hand corners. We find windows set back with reflecting surfaces in front of them, apparently ways to bring daylight deeper into the building. This is my mis I'm going to go backwards and apologize for this confusion. I'm now trying to figure out, get both of these working correctly. There we go. It happens. The right-hand button does the other projector for me, and I've got them backwards. Well, let's look, for example, in the dining room addition to his own home. On the left is a kind of standard diagram. It says that in order to compensate for the natural fall off of daylighting when you come away from windows, a good way is to try to bring in a new daylighting resource farther in the space. And in that way, you can enhance the daylight deeper into the room. So we go into the dining room area. And first, we see the value of the splayed walls. So instead of sharp angled walls in, corner, in uh, shadow, you begin to see that each of the windows can illuminate the wall in between the windows, and that becomes a reflecting surface. Here you find the clear story penetrating well into the room, so you get daylight penetrating way down here. But now you find another thing. All these famous built-in cabinets that Frank Lloyd Wright did, but these are light shelves. He's bouncing the light off of that and bringing it up. Everything that Wright did was to bring the daylight along the ceiling, so it would trans travel along the ceiling and penetrate deep into the room. Even his furniture, his putting his counters underneath his windows, was to provide for that. And windows always opening out, so you have the sense of expansion to the outside world. Wright's playroom addition as well, showing a remarkable approach toward trilateral daylighting, bringing daylighting in from multiple directions at once, from left and right and from top. Left and right, again, you see the the deep cabinets, which also serve then to diffuse the daylight up. And that's balanced by the daylight coming through the skylight coming down. And right very early on, showing his control of the direct overhead daylighting, putting an outside skylight, which would already diffuse, and then inside using these wonderful decorative patterns, which is this one right here, in order to further diffuse and soften the daylight on the inside. This is his 19, 1895 playroom. And now we go to the 1898 studio edition. 
Wright had worked 1893 to 1898 in an office in downtown Chicago, and I'll go to that in a minute. And he came back and built his office, and let's look inside that. One of the things one wants to do with top lighting is if you really want to diffuse the daylighting, I'm sure you all know that you would like to put the diffusion on the outside um, to soften it before it comes in, and so you find that Wright used two level skylights. The wire glass skylight on the outside there and on the outside here was his first softening approach as well as providing the weather protection. But then we go inside, and if you still have too much brightness from an overhead skylight, then we'd like to have a further kind of diffuser on the inside. We've always revered these beautiful patterns he puts on the roof. The fact is that the amount of surface that he covered on that with, with his decorative design was designed to give him the right amount of diffusion and the right amount of sunlight below. So he has the upper and inner skylights, which I call lay lights, so that by the time you get in, you've got this, this soft, diffused glow, which people have also written about in Wright's buildings, without ever consciously um, trying to analyze. Wright needed to get away from it. He had his own little private sanctum. He had his library to the right of the main entryway. He had a bit of a dark passage down. As you came down the passage, it opened up this beautiful daylight sort of inviting you in. And when you in, went into the library on the right-hand side, you found daylight from everywhere. Daylight from all of the sides, brought in high, daylight from overhead. And you're looking at a fully daylit space. This is where Wright did his thinking. This is where he would do his sketches and his designs, and where he'd haul out sketches, and where he would do his thinking. And that's the environment he gave himself in order to do his creative work. <coughs> we now turn to the drafting studio on the other side. And we find something quite remarkable about it, that although it's a two-story building, as shown here, he cored out the inside of the building so that you have the high daylight and resource coming down through it. And you already have Wright's uh, atrium in his very first office that he designed and built for himself. He worked downstairs. You clearly have ample lighting. You work upstairs, you have ample lighting. And Wright believed in the different levels of work communicating with one another. Now we're looking on the top level. Wright was not um, unwilling to experiment on himself. And for example, in here, on the top level, he, he did the uh, artwork and the glasswork and the photography and things of that sort. When he first built it, roof beams came right down to here, and there was no glass there. This was the roof line. And after Wright moved into it, he said there wasn't enough daylight. And he went back, and he took the roof, and he broke it right here, and bent it up, and put another set of clear stories in, and then said that was enough. So that he didn't intuitively, immediately, always know how much to bring in, but he was quite willing to experiment. And once he'd experimented, he had learned his lesson. He always had the windows open outward again, so you always had this reaching out to the outside world from the inside. Well, what I'm going to do now is to move almost exclusively for almost all the rest of this talk to Wright's commercial buildings, if you will, as opposed to his residences. I'm going to come back at the end to his residences, but these are two entirely different stories and two enormous stories. And the kinds of things we're writing about these days are mostly focused on what you might call the buildings as opposed to the residences. On the left, we have the Chicago that Frank Lloyd Wright lived in. And starting around the 1870s, the Chicago School of Architects had figured out the light cord in the atrium. And so looking down, it was a common feature in Chicago buildings to have your atrium and your light cord. You see here, you see here, you see here. This is a common approach toward the architecture in Chicago. On the right-hand side happens to be a section of Louis Sullivan's Wainwright building, 1894. We'll come back to that. But that also shows that if you don't carve it out, you can also notch it. The purpose of that is so that everybody working in office had access to daylight on this side or access to the daylight on that side. And you had an axial flow of air through. And if you didn't do it that way, you did it this way. This was the climate in which Wright was working when he was beginning to do his own professional work. Well, 1893, Wright left the employ of Sullivan, not entirely of his own choosing. He had been moonlighting and was prohibited from doing it. So he was, in fact, booted out, but it was OK. He had already done nine or 10 homes. He was ready to go on his own. And he took up uh, an office for six years in the rookery. The rookery is designed by John Root, 
Burnham and Root, they were among the people who had been doing some of the most interesting daylit and uh, light court and atrium buildings in Chicago. And so this was the interior of the building where Wright himself worked for six years. Um, Wright, in fact, was commissioned to redo this, the great staircase they have in there and everything now are Frank Lloyd Wright designed. So obviously all of this sunk in. Contrary to what a lot of people say, a lot of scholars like to write about the Larkin building and say, isn't this wonderful? Frank Lloyd Wright invented the skylight atrium with balconies in. He didn't at all. That was a kind of standard. In fact, Burnham and Root and the Burlington Quincy building, which no longer exists, the interior looked very much like the Larkin building with daylight coming in from the top and balconies and all of that. Well, what did Wright do then that was different? What was great about his early work? This is not Wright's work. This is one more extremely important influence on Wright, which was his employer, Louis Sullivan. This is really considered to be the forerunner of the modern high-rise office buildings now. You can see how different it is from, from the previous picture, beginning to get vertical lines, beginning to look much more like our office buildings. This is a notched building. When Wright got the chance to do his first office building for the Larkin Soap Company in 1903, he was commissioned, came out with the Larkin building, and here are his earliest sketches on the left. You begin to see some things he did that were a little different. He did close in the notch, and he did glaze over at the top, which was unusual. Most of the glazed buildings, it turns out, even though they might have a 10-story light well, put the glass down at the second or third story. Wright moved the glass all the way to the top and created the first hermetically sealed office building in the United States. He did that because it was built next to a railroad yard. It was dirty outside. They needed to clean the air. And so Wright sealed the building off, then brought the air in, bubbled it through water in order to clean it, and brought it in the building. In the process, it cooled the air. And so this is the first air-conditioned office building in the United States. We have a view inside here as well, and we will go in further and look. <clears throat> there we are on the left-hand side now with the Museum of Modern Art version of, of Wright's design for the uh, atrium. And on the right-hand side, we have it. Um, we see electric lights installed. When Wright did this, the electric light had come in, but we see the electric lights off. We see an almost shadow-free environment with daylighting coming from the left, right, front, back, and top. We go to the balcony work areas, and we find some other things. It was a standard rule of thumb that Louis Sullivan operated by, everybody operated by. That is that your office could be two to two and a half times the height of the window and depth for usable daylight. This is still the rule of thumb that people use today. We look in here, and we find where you have the bright daylight source. Wright is now putting the windows up at the top. This allows for exterior shading. It also allows the light to come in and wash the ceiling, and the ceiling becomes a reverse light show. This was his trick for getting daylight to penetrate far in. When you're looking into the light court on the right-hand side, of course, it's much dimmer light, and therefore his windows are much bigger and much lower. So he's now tailoring the size of the windows. The result, if you look at this, and realize it's a photograph, and you don't have control over the contrast, and yet it looks remarkably contrast-free. It looks to me from that photograph as though he achieved a remarkable uniformity of lighting by carefully placing the inside and the outside glazing differently and sizing it differently. Another thing you notice again, there are the electric lights and they're off. And here's where Wright really made his statement. It was common in Chicago from the 1870s to about 1900 to daylight the spaces, then the electric light came in, and the electric light was the new architectural symbol, and architects turned to it. And they used the electric light. And when Frank Lloyd Wright started out with the Larkin building and put in the great light court, he didn't have to anymore. We had electric light. Wright put it in specifically so the electric light could be turned off. He didn't want the electric light for two reasons. This was an air-conditioned building. The electric light made heat. He didn't want to put extra heat in the building. He substituted daylighting for electric light heating. This, in fact, is a primary reason why we're approaching daylighting today in order to conserve energy in buildings. Secondly, he didn't like to depend on the electric light. And so Wright started designing for daylight just at the time that you didn't need to do it anymore. His design for daylight was in order to get the quality of the interior environment, not because he had to have daylight. 
And that was a statement that Wright made that set him apart from the other architects of his day. Here indeed is what I just said, and I forgot I had this sequence. We don't save any electric energy at all if we don't have daylight control dimming, but if we do, then mathematically we can size our skylights so that we end up with a net energy gain. Even though you've got passive solar heat coming in the skylight, you save more energy up to a certain size by dimming the electric lights. This was a prime reason that Wright brought daylight into the Larkin building so that it wouldn't uh, become uncomfortably hot in the summer. So he had a total energy awareness. At the same time, 1904, he was designing the first of his great churches, Unity Temple, also in Oak Park, within walking distance of the Holman Studio Foundation. Both have been beautifully restored, and I really urge all of you to make a pilgrimage up there and walk around. You'll see about 30 Frank Lloyd Wright homes plus Unity Temple and the Holman Studio all within walking distance. And on Unity Temple, we began to see some more, a higher sophistication of his approach toward his daylighting. Again, more and more apparent now, windows coming in high. Windows coming in high where you can fully shade them, but where you can do something else remarkable, and that is use the bottom side of the overhang to bounce light off the sill, up onto the overhang and in, or bounce light off of the sidewalk, up on the overhang and in. And so the windows up high, which became a characteristic of his homes as well as his buildings, was not only to bring the daylight in high along the ceiling, but also to see to it that the reflected daylight off the building surfaces would come in along the ceiling. So we look at some more pictures of the Unity Temple, indeed a very different approach. This is a wonderful contrast over here, I think, between two approaches to designing for the worship of God and for the service of man. Now here's what I was speaking about. Overhangs are not just shading devices. Remember, you've got about 8,000 foot candles of direct beam solar radiation. You only want 50 or so inside. So you can afford to lose 99% of it. And if you look at it that way, it really allows you to bounce the daylight around. And the bottom side of overhangs become diffusing surfaces for transmitting daylight inside. So here we are with the high windows up here, fully shaded with your vertical fins, if you will, the Frank Lloyd Wright version, as well as your horizontal skylight, a very bright sill to reflect up in here. And you see how illuminated the bottom part of that overhang is, how much reflection it is getting in and transmitting inside. And here is some of the remarkable result. This is one of the few of Wright's drawings where he actually shows that he was paying attention to penetration of sun and shadows. Here he's drawn the shading line that goes from the edge of the overhang to the sill, which is right there, of the skylight. And what he's showing is that this clear story right here, I, I meant clear story, not skylight. This clear story will bring light and penetrate into the shadow areas here. And this clear story will penetrate into the shadow areas here. But if you sit in here, you have no direct view. All right? The reason we have a direct view is I'm up in the balcony right now. Look in the balcony in here, where it normally would be dark, and see the clear story from the other side doing its job to illuminate you when you're in church with soft daylight, rather than have you be in the dark. Right skylight overhead in order then to fill in the, the uh, seated area, the floor area, also shows many of the techniques we now recognize as appropriate. Instead of having one central skylight, dispersing the skylights is what you want to do in order to get uniform daylighting through the space. In this case, he had venting skylights as well, so that you could, you could vent the, uh, the heat from the, from the building. Another thing you notice as you look up here is that the skylights are looking down in light wells. And here is a result from that. Wright wanted this sense, this sense of the reality of the space, the outside coming through, the inside carrying through. When you're down here, sitting here, you don't see the glass. The light well is shielding the view of the glass, the brightness in your eyes, so that your eye can open up and appreciate the more gentle daylighting in there. Look at this picture over here as a remarkable example of daylight everywhere without harsh glare uh, from the glass. If we did that building today, we would be extremely proud of, of our results. And that was 1904. Let's move on to Wright's own home, where he began to express some of these things. His later home, you just saw his first home. He moved to Wisconsin 
and he created Taliesin, which he first built in 1911. Many of you know that Taliesin is a Welsh word meaning shining brow, because Taliesin was built on the brow of this hill that looks out here. Hence the name for Taliesin. On Taliesin, once again, as we look up it, there we see the windows right along, underneath the overhang, up high, shaded, carrying on what he had, he had certainly uh, learned earlier. We go inside Taliesin. These are very difficult photos to take unless you cheat and use flash, which I don't like to do in these sort of things. But to show the, the amount of daylighting coming in, now remember these windows are shaded. This is not sunlight coming in. This is daylight coming in. But also to show the rooms going out, and then where he thinks it'll be a little dark, all these little high clear stories up here, so that the roof is illuminated. So another thing Wright was doing at this time was filling in all the dark corners of daylight. And you found him doing that through the rest of his architectural days. Didn't like dark corners. If the corner was going to be dark, then let the daylight fill it in and soften it. Turning around from where I was standing in the living room in Taliesin, the left-hand picture. A lot of my pictures I've just taken from magazines and books. You can tell by the quality, but they show things. Also showing the clear stories there and another clear story here and the reflecting surface there in order to bring light back in an area that would otherwise be, be dark. Other rooms in Taliesin. Um, I take this back, and I should have put this a little bit later. This is in the building called Hillside, which is right next to Taliesin, but also writes, carrying on with many of the things we'd seen developed earlier here, where you would always have a Sunday morning meetings with a fellowship, not only the daylight coming in from here, but then the diffuse daylight up there off the ceiling, where they would eat, the dining room, which still looks like that today, bilateral daylighting from both sides, reflecting surfaces off the ceiling. Now, this is Hillside, and I'm sorry I reversed the previous slides. Wright built Taliesin in 1911 at Bern in 1914. He rebuilt it at Bern in 1925, and he rebuilt it. That was his home. Wright created the Taliesin Fellowship, the Frank Lloyd Wright Fellowship in 1932. That may sound like a long time ago to you. Wright was 65 years old. He founded the fellowship in 1932, and he started the last 27 years of his work. He started a new creative phase that any architect would have been proud to have, I think. One thing he did is decide that he needed to expand the fellowship and to have more architectural room available. He had built the Hillside School, which is right here in 1903, for his aunts. And in 1933, one year after he formed the fellowship, then he attached onto Hillside what became the drafting room area for Taliesin. And that's where the work is done in the summer in Wisconsin. As you look at it, you already see some unusual features on the roof. And they're not unusual. They are north-facing skylights. They are glazed like this. These are all north-facing here. East and west-facing, where you will get your harshest light, he's got ribbon strips still. Because to write, you're not just daylighting, you're sunlighting. So you want to bring in the greatest amount of light where it is easiest to manage, which in this case was north. But you also wanted to bring in at least some splashes, some sunbeams. And so he would put his lighting in on the east and west side. But Wright also developed another concept that has been widely written about in Hillside. And we'll go back to a principle to see that. When you do have sunlight coming in through side windows, you've got to do something. You can't work with the sun blasting on your desk. You have to filter it in some way. So Wright loved to use vegetation to filter the sunlight. And that was an inspiration as well for these magnificent windows that he designed, where he would put abstract patterns of the vegetation. And you look through the Wright patterns into the vegetation while the vegetation is doing the filtering. But at Taliesin, in Wisconsin, he did something differently. He moved the forest inside the drafting room. And he wrote about it that way. He said, well, I can't build a forest outside my roof, and so I'm going to build it inside. And I'm going to have us working here. Notice there are no electric lights on here whatsoever. And you've got the skylights all along the building. But he wanted the effect of being in a forest where the sunlight would be diffused, not by light colored here, but by dark branches, and come filtering on down. He achieved that effect remarkably, as you can see on the right-hand side. And once again, if you walk around on your light meter, you'll be in the range of 60-foot candles to 90-foot candles. So he got just the right amount of light as well as the quality that he wanted. 
This is 1933 that he did Hillside, just a couple of more pictures, living and working within the forest. And he wrote about it, used that metaphor himself. And he came back to it many times later in other buildings. I'm going to skip up to 1947 to the church in which I was married, which is the Unitarian Church in Madison, Wisconsin. Here Wright made a statement about worship, and instead of having the steeple, he replaced the steeple with the praying hands here. And then he took the roof. This is north-facing glass right here. And he took the roof, and he folded the roof down over the north-facing glass so that even in the summer, when you have the sun rising to the northeast, where it would be on a Sunday morning, it cannot penetrate through that glass and provide glare to the inside of the space. And so we go to the inside of the space. We look at the shaded prow, the roof itself now providing as you know, when you're trying to shade on the east and west, you've got to use vertical shading. And basically, bringing the roof down provides that vertical shading. And on the inside, you're finding something that Wright did a great deal of, and that is he didn't use the daylight as a daylighting resource in the church so much as to soften it enough that when you're inside the church, you're looking out. Once again, you're in the forest. And he called this the church in the woods. And so he built some of the woods and the branches right here. And I'm afraid the photograph doesn't do it justice, but you're obviously looking through the window right at these trees when you're sitting inside. So there's that tree metaphor coming back. 1906, Wright went to Japan. It was kind of a pilgrimage. He was 39 years old at the time. He revered the Japanese print. He revered the simplicity of design and of line. And he went to Japan in order to learn more about the culture that could make these beautiful Japanese prints. That led to a commission to come back to Japan in 1910. He lived there for six years while he was designing and building the extraordinary Imperial Hotel. On the left are some of his earlier drawings. On the right-hand side, an aerial view of the hotel. It was demolished in 1968, so we have to show these views out of books and magazines and things. But let's talk about it for a moment. For example, I said it was demolished in 1968, and here's a picture I took about one month ago. Well, the Japanese had closed the country to Western influences. They were afraid of it until 1868. And that was when the Emperor Meiji came in and said, Japan has to open up her doors. And of course, we've all seen what's happened since. And as Japan has been developing, Japan has been recognizing the influence of major and Western contributors to Japan cultural and technological development. And so in the case of the Imperial Hotel, where they're right across the street from the Imperial Palace, they felt the need to develop a new modern hotel that could have modern facilities and things. They asked Wright to redesign the Imperial Hotel to upgrade it, and he refused, because he said it would destroy the architecture. And so the decision was finally rather reluctantly made to tear it down. But then the Japanese very carefully took down brick by brick and marked the bricks. And this section right in here is this section right here. And the Japanese have established an architectural park about 250 miles northwest of Tokyo called Meiji Mura. And in that, they've got 25 or 30 rebuilt examples of important architectural influence. And here is the lobby and entryway for the Imperial Hotel. Well, the wonderful thing about that is it enables us to compare the original with today, to walk in and get a sense of the quality, and in my case, of the daylighting. On the left is a photograph of the original. On the right-hand side is the photograph of the reconstructed front portion at Meiji Mura. And now we go inside. And on the left hand is a picture of the grand entryway. And now you see extraordinary daylighting approach. Daylighting down a ground level here from left, right, and front, already moving in with clear story here in order to wash this roof line here and penetrate further. Another clear story there in order to wash this roof line and penetrate further. Another clear story here to wash that roof line to walk the daylight in the space. And did it really? Yes, we can just stand there and look at the rebuilt one, and there it is. And so you find this incredible sense of gradually letting the daylight walk in so you have a uniform sense of lighting in the space. And now when people rhapsodically write about this, this daylighting glow, you go into Frank Lloyd Wright buildings and they glow. And you're seeing that they don't glow accidentally, right? Very consciously and carefully designed in the mechanism to have it glow. A glow suggests a sort of uniform lighting, uh, shadow-free lighting. And we can see that for ourselves. 
On the left-hand side, a picture from the original hotel. On the right-hand side, a picture of the reconstructed portion. Now we move around to the side. And the exterior view of this particular room, here's the room on the inside. All right? There's a great deal of glass, which when you're inside, looks like it could cause a considerable amount of glare. But you go outside, and you find right, again, playing with horizontal overhangs, vertical fins, more horizontal overhangs, slot windows down here. And whereas he's shading below these overhangs, the, this horizontal overhang, this is also a sill. It's designed to bounce the light back up into the roof. There's your light-colored roof angled upward to get the daylight to penetrate inside. So on the right hand and left hand are pictures that I took of the reconstructed portion. You've got that enormous amount of glass, yet you'll see very little sunlight coming in, but some sunlight coming in. He wants some sunlight coming in. The sunlight moves on the floor. It changes with the time of day. But you're not being blasted by sunlight through the space, because again, here we are with our sheltering of the windows, and then this wonderful use of the sill here and the use of the sill here. See how bright that is, bouncing up here? See how bright it is there, bouncing up there? Look at the glow on the ceiling. All of this designed in to provide the shading as well as the transmission of the light to produce that quality of glow. Now we go around farther behind in the reconstructed building. Here he's using outside surfaces. The top of the clear story, the top of the overhang becomes a light shelf to reflect into the next level of building. And you accomplish that by moving the next level of building back in. You go up here. I couldn't get above it, but clearly there's another light-colored roof that acts as a light shelf and then bounces up in here. And as you look up, you see the bottoms, the undersurface of the overhangs painted white again in order to get that progressive stepped transmission of light deep into the building, the famous glow. Now on the left-hand side, if we came in the entryway and just turned around, you face the great and beautiful dining room. And it's a tragedy now that that's not there. The building has stopped right here. There's a solid wall, and there it is right in there. So we can't see that now. But as we turn around and face the other direction away from the entry, we find he takes the building and he begins to step it back down again in order to assure that the light will come in and the whole place here will be illuminated and it will be illuminated up here. Then you walk into the dining room, which did not have the daylighting except on the sides. And it invites you in. And this became another characteristic of white rights, and that was to daylight the transition zones for you. So you would never come in from the outside, bright outside, to a dark, electric-lit interior. You would walk through a daylight transition. And I'm going to show you pictures all the way through 1959 of how that was accomplished. I'm going to move up now to 1927, which is the Biltmore Hotel. There is controversy about it because it's officially designed by Albert MacArthur, not Frank Lloyd Wright. The fact is, Wright didn't have much work at the time. MacArthur had been a former apprentice of his, and he invited Mr. Wright to come work in his office behind the scenes. Imagine Frank Lloyd Wright working behind the scenes. What's become quite clear now is that Wright designed the building, and MacArthur did the working drawings. Um, but Wright was basically sworn to secrecy. Well, he has his own ways of being secret. Somebody asked him point blank inside the Biltmore, Mr. Wright, did you design the building? And he waved his hand expansively, and he said, look around you. He said, the spaces speak for themselves. And he said nothing more. So you can take that as an admission or whatever you want to do. Well, in the Biltmore, there was great controversy, and they weren't speaking to each other after about six months. And you can see missing in it a lot of the things you would ordinarily see in the Frank Lloyd Wright design. The overhangs, the clear stories, a lot of the characteristics here are missing. And yet, when you go inside, you still find some of the transition zones. I took these pictures also just a week ago. So this is the current Biltmore. You come in the front door. You have side lighting here. So the whole entryway becomes a transition zone. Standing right at this point, if I turn around now and face inward, that's what I see. And so the daylight draws you into the interior. As you walk through, your eye can gradually accustom and open up. And those are very definitely characteristics of Wright's daylighting design approach. And as you go through the hotel, you find places to sit. You find little places where the daylight can penetrate. Whenever there's going to be a dark corner, he'll do that. If this were going to be dark, there's enough reflection from there, softening the corners with daylight. Very definitely Frank Lloyd Wright statements. 
the Arizona room was one that Wright did design. He admitted it, and so did MacArthur. And that's the only room that remains today that still has the, side, the uh, high clear story lighting and the, and the top lighting. It's now used as an office. And once again, you can see this soft, almost shadow-free diffusion of daylight that he accomplished with his placement of the windows and his sizing of everything, that beautiful fireplace on the left. Back to the metaphor of the tree. Wright loved the idea of being in the forest. Another technique that was used in the late 1800s in commercial buildings was to have exposed structure, exposed vertical things, columns holding up the roof. So Wright didn't invent that. But in 1931, he was commissioned to do a building called the Capitol Journal Building for Portland, Oregon. And here he did his first statement of the dendroform column, this sort of mushroom-shaped column. What's different about this building from the other buildings people were doing is that this is all glass. He surrounded the building in glass so that when you were inside, you had the glass, and the column, instead of holding up the roof, became the forest. And he started writing about, let us move down from the foliage into the base of the forest. And he started playing around with this wonderful design on the commission he got in 1935 to do the, the Johnson Wax administration building. And that led to one of the most famous office buildings in the world. On the left, where he had carried out his design, he now has the Dendroford columns standing 24 feet high. They're 20 feet wide at the top. They're only 9 inches wide at the bottom. And in between all of these is glass, is skylight. And if you look on the roof right here, you can see the skylight glazing to bring the sunlight or daylight down below. And so here we have pictures inside. I won't go into now why. I'm showing black and whites and a picture from a magazine, even though I've taken many recent pictures. But to show the quality of the daylight filtering down again from above, putting people far enough down so it has a chance to diffuse, so you're working in the forest. You're within the forest again. And it's an extraordinary place uh, within which to work. In a way, this was the start of the open plan. This is a 30,000 square foot office space you're looking at, this one office space in the great workroom. And today, 50 years later, it functions just as efficiently and just as well as an open plan office as it did when it was first designed. And you're looking on the left hand uh, to a picture that obviously was taken very earlier. There are no task lights. Look at these old uh, typewriters and everything like that. And see the quality of the daylighting in the workplace. <clears throat> well, Wright got the daylighting by doing a number of things. Again. Partly it was the way he built a skylight. And it is well known that he selected glass tubes that he wanted to use for the skylights for this place. And the glass tubes weren't made, and he told the glazing companies to make them, and they did. And he used them for their diffusion quality. And he wrote about how they would give this sparkling quality and the diffusion to the light. And of course, a daylight space at nighttime gives light back out, and that's really very beautiful. And I just thought I would show this. Now, 20 years later, the Johnson Wax Administration Building was designed in 1935 and built in 36. 20 years later, in 1955, Frank Lloyd Wright had another commission to build a 600-foot-long electric manufacturing plant on the San Francisco Bay side in San Mateo. It was a company called Lenkert Electric. And this was to show you that within four years of when he died, and Wright was 88 years old at this time, Wright still very much liked the quality he'd gotten at Johnson Wax. And he was still designing that. And again, in one of the few sketches that Wright did where he explicitly showed the daylight streaming down into the space. But on the Lenkert Electric, he began playing with the skylights and making the skylights more of an architectural statement in themselves. And here we have, again, some of the very few drawings we find of Wright's where he's specifically working with light control and showing it. I actually don't believe that's what he's doing here. Here he's showing this pagoda-shaped skylight on here. And for anyone who's seen Alvar Aalto drawings with beautifully uh, ruled lines, and you look at this sort of thing by Frank Lloyd Wright, and you think, what on earth is that guy doing? And I'm convinced that he wasn't designing when he did this sketch. He was simply showing somebody else. He was talking to somebody. He was saying, look, if you stand here, slash, slash, you'll get sunlight there. And if you stand here, slash, slash, you'll get sunlight there. 
But then he's very careful. Here he comes out to the side and he's sizing the overhang to give you the shading here. And on the skylight, he's deciding that maybe you're going to get too much sunlight in there. And so in his handwriting, he specifies adjustable copper louvers so that you can go up and then set the copper louvers to give you just the right amount of diffusion after it's up. It's kind of an architectural fudge factor, but it, it showed that he was building in that capability. On the left is the Lenkert Electric Daytime. On the right is the way it would have been at nighttime. The working drawings of the building were finished. Lenkert sold out to Westinghouse, and Westinghouse decided not to build it. This is one of many buildings that could be built today that would function beautifully today. And one of my dedications is to see to it that this building is bought by a client someday and built. So there's a, an, an early idea of rights going back to his Talies and that he carried all the way through to one of his last designs. The idea of dispersing, skylight, uh, dispersing sunlight with glass was not new to Wright. Indeed, in the late 1800s, the Luxfer Prism Company was making prisms that were designed to be put in sidewalks in Chicago to disperse light down into subways, and designed to be put in homes and in clear stories and also commercial buildings in order to bring daylight in. And here's an ad by Lux for Prism right here and showing Lux for Prism on the roof, showing how the prisms take the light that comes in and it angles it. And so the light is a box-sized hotel. You're in a hot climate, a hot, humid climate, yet you want to illuminate it without overheating. These are sheets of glass on either side with translucent insulation on the inside. So you have a low mass wall passing about 1% of the daylighting through. So once again, the wall of the room glows with the wall itself becoming the daylighting resource. But perhaps more remarkable, now looking at the whole hotel design, is not just the translucent wall hotel, but the 55-story tower, which also had translucent walls. And that was another contribution that Wright made, that he had started in 1924. That was to free the building skin from its role of holding the building up. And he developed the central core approach with the cantilever which was the structure of the building. And in so doing, he freed the building skin so he could do whatever he wanted to with the building skin. And what he wanted to do with it was to turn it into a non-structural daylighting resource. He did a, a conceptual design in 1924. He did another one in 1925. But he didn't really get to carry out that idea until Johnson Wax Company came back and commissioned Wright in 1939 to do a research tower. On the left, I'm sorry, I forgot this picture on the left. This is his 1924 sketch where he was developing this design approach. And on the right is the um, sketch of the Johnson Wax Tower showing how the, the skin of the building now becomes a nothingness. So you can do what you want to with it. And what he wanted to do with it as much as possible was make it into a nothingness. But in order to bring the daylight in usably, he had to diffuse it. So he wrapped it with his glass tubing. When Wright didn't bring the light in through the walls of the building, he liked to bring it in from overhead. And he developed that more and more sophisticated level over the years. In 1938, he was commissioned by Florida Southern to do an entire campus. And the first building that was designed in 1938 was the Pfeiffer Chapel. And on the chapel, they have what's called the Lantern Tower right here. And the Lantern Tower was, in part, Wright's way of bringing daylight into the building from above. And here we have a sketch. And once again, we have something very rare that you find in Frank Lloyd Wright's sketches. And that is that here was originally solid to be solid ceiling. And he drew lines to show that the, the sunlight coming in from there and the daylight would not make it down here. And he wanted that quality. So he went back. And this is in his handwriting, saying, put a skylight here. And then he obviously just slashed in a few lines, saying, if we put a skylight there, you'll get better distribution of the daylight inside. And the result of that simple sketch, in order to one of his draftsmen to go back and do it, was this. Now you're inside the chapel. Not only do we have the, the daylighting from the side, the high lighting washing this light ceiling that we're now so familiar with, but you have a remarkable feature. Those skylights are not just for daylight. Normally, where you'd look up and you'd have a big structure over your head, you'd have some kind of humongous thing holding it up. Wright wanted that tower to float over you. It sits on air. 
You have glass. You have nothing you can see through it. The tower floats above you. It sits on air. So you're sitting in air and light inside the Pfeiffer Chapel. Continuing with his overhead skylighting, one of his well-known buildings designed in 1940, uh, forgetting my dates now, 46, was the V.C. Morris Gift Shop in San Francisco. You go down what seems to be a fairly ordinary street called Maiden Lane, and you can see a quite unordinary building partway down. And so we will go into the V.C. Morris shop. I love to, you can't go in without taking pictures of the entryway. I realized I didn't have good pictures of this and took these just last week and ran into a problem that I'll describe just briefly. So as you go into the entryway, all of a sudden you find you're not going through a door, you're going through a glass transition zone that reaches into the building, as you see on the right-hand side. And you come inside of the building and it's top lit, and it's got skylights, the familiar skylights outside, the wire glass, and then with the daylight diffused by the acrylic lenses on the inside. It is now being used as a gallery. Uh, one thing I found out after I took the pictures is that they were a little bit too dark, which is my fault as a photographer. But another is that there's not quite enough daylight coming through. And only later did I learn that the skylights have been partially painted over and the owners are wanting to get them unpainted. But we look up here and once again we see an expression in 1946-47 of Wright's approach toward top lighting the store. And here's the familiar ramps going up. And where else have we seen those ramps? Excuse me, I forgot this picture. I went up to the top here just to show you by peeking the camera over the edge here how this, in fact, is just a suspended acrylic thing. And when you look through there, you can see the wire glass skylight above. This goes right back to his home in 1895, the same principle. Where have we seen these file ramps? Guggenheim Museum. I haven't been in where I've been permitted to take pictures inside yet, so I'll show you these. The Guggenheim was actually designed earlier, before V.C. Morris. Designed 1943, but was built later. later. Now, I'll show these two pictures, and then I'll show this picture, and that picture. And what's the relationship? The relationship is that John Portman, who really built the first of the top-lit Hyatt Regencies in Atlanta, Georgia, neither of which is shown in this picture, um, acknowledges that he got his inspiration for the top lighting, opening out the inside to an atrium with top lighting for the hotels. He got his inspiration from the V.C. Morris shop and from the Guggenheim Museum. So this happens to be a hotel in Singapore again, so I was wandering around photographing, but showing a kind of very modern expression of one approach toward emulating Wright's top lighting is not only to bring just daylight in, but also to allow shafts of sunlight to come down and to have some sense of sunlight deep in the interior of the hotels. But that actually is not what Wright himself was doing with his top lighting. So in 1946, Wright designed a building which was not built, a YWCA for Racine, Wisconsin, and the whole roof is glass. And the reason he made it glass is so that the entire top would have the swimming pool, not buried down in the basement. But the swimming pool would become a garden court on the top, and that's in Wisconsin, where it gets cold. And so he's got the glazing over it to protect it. But furthermore, inside the building, saying, I'm not just top lighting and bringing a little light inside, opening out the whole inside of the building so the inside becomes a garden that expands outward. And indeed, on Wright's design for the Rogers Lacey Hotel, there in 1946 is Wright's approach to what he wanted to see in the daylighting of the interior of hotels with his sketch on the left and then the colored rendering on the right. Not a little bit of glass and a closed building, but the building expansively opening out so there's a real garden and things growing. Well, some of that's being emulated more and more, too. This is the Meridian Hotel again in Singapore. Um, and I'm, I'm not advertising Singapore. I bought a new camera in Singapore with a zoom lens and was having a wonderful time tearing around, taking pictures, trying out the camera in the zoom lens, which is why you are now being treated to Singapore pictures. But this is really much more consistent. If there were a legacy as to what Wright was trying to accomplish in the interior of hotels, I would say it would be this rather than what Portman did. In any case, we now have uh, certainly a new approach toward hotel design, whether it was directly influenced by Wright or not. Uh, I don't know what to say, except that Wright anticipated it. 
And one of my three criteria of a legacy was to anticipate what others do later. Well, let's look at this. Another way to bring daylight deep into buildings is to split the envelope. This is in 1901. Frank Lloyd Wright designed these apartments called the Lexington Terrace Apartments. And since you have apartments here and apartments here, he just split the envelope so that you can have a daylighting and a fresh air resource from both sides of the building. On the right-hand side, you see a detail of that. And that was expressed from 1901 to 1957, 56 years later, when Wright started designing the Marin County Civic Center um, also as a split envelope building to provide a daylighting resource to every single office in the interior of Marin County. So this is another approach toward the split envelope and a development, if you will, of his earlier ideas. And he wrote about this. And he said he wanted every office to be adjacent to daylight, at least on one side. Outer offices on the outside, and the inner offices, of course, here. On the top, you're closest to the diffusing glass late in the evening. You've got the nice patterns. Well, while we're talking about bringing sunlight in from the sides, again, we need to step back and say, wait a minute, glare is a problem. We've got to be aware of that. Again, as I said earlier, you've got to avoid the direct sun on the task. This is very definitely not Frank Lloyd Wright. It shows the kinds of things people are doing to build overhangs, computer-designed overhangs, in order to provide just the right shading um, so that you won't get the direct sun on the task inside. Now we go back to Marin County, and you find that Frank Lloyd Wright knew you needed exterior shading, but he wasn't about to hang things on it. He makes the building skin the shading device. The skin hangs away from the window. And if you look here, the only illuminated part here is the little bit on the bottom. Everything else is in the shade. The building skin serves as the shading overhang. So some more pictures of that. You don't have to hang gigos on a building to provide the shading. Let the building design do it. And what you've created is a very nice walkway right here now. You come outside the double glass door, and you can walk along there and go in. And so your shading overhang becomes an opportunity to go out and to have this communication with the outside. Well, some of those kinds of things of patterning the skins of buildings are being done by others. This is the Hilton Hotel in downtown Phoenix doing much the same kind of thing. <clears throat> well, let's go turn to a building where you can't really bring daylight in. This is the last non-residential design that Frank Lloyd Wright did. It's the Grady Gamage Auditorium in, in um, Phoenix, in Tempe, actually, at the university campus. I also took these pictures just a week ago. For 25 years, I've been going down there and only recently realized I needed pictures of these things for the talk since I've been running around having a great time. But inside an auditorium, you're not going to be bringing sunlight in and daylighting. You've really got to provide your own lighting. But you see what Wright's doing here again. He's going to have his transition zones inside. He's using the skin of the building to provide shading overhangs. And so walking around in this, as I did last week, you'll notice the daylight transition zone on the right. On the left-hand side, as you go into the ticket area, I see it's 9.20, and I'm probably within about uh, four or five minutes of finishing. I'm sorry it's going quite so long, but I told you I was going to use you as guinea pigs for what I put together yesterday and see how it felt. <clears throat> Bringing the outside in, right does it in part by just carrying the patterns from the outside in here. And the actually one of the building maintenance people took me through there and said he has a lot of fun when people ask him, what are those for? And he says, well, the fresh water comes in here and the sewage goes out there. <clears throat> but notice how the daylight is used in the building as a constant transition from the inside to the outside. And here we are now on this upper balcony where you can come out, of course. During intermissions, you can walk around here. If it happens to be during the daytime, you're protected. At the nighttime, you're also protected. And using the skin of the building as your shading resource. I mentioned that Wright used daylight to fill out the corners where they'd be otherwise dark. And so we go to the, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church in Milwaukee, Wauwatosa where Wright didn't really use daylighting so much except to complement the electric lighting. 
And I showed these pictures. These were snapped, and they're not very good pictures, but I, I can make a point with them. On the outside, we see his decorative fascia detail along here, as well as his windows. But when you come inside, you see that the decorative fascia detail is, in fact, a very small, clear story made out of glass balls, so the balls themselves will diffract the light up onto the ceiling and fill in what otherwise would have been a dark corner. So here we are looking more directly at the tube. The electric lighting is beautiful inside this building. But if you turn this electric lighting on and you did not have the daylighting resource, everything around there would be dark and you'd be focused here. And Wright didn't want that. So here I took this picture with the electric lighting off and then turned the electric lighting and put it on here. This is not the sun shining through there. Again, this is just a contrast problem I'm having with my slide film that I'm sure you photographers will recognize. So I didn't do a very good job photographing it. But the purpose of the daylighting here is not to provide daylight into the space, but to have the daylighting fill in so the space will glow while the electric lighting provides beauty inside. So he was not opposed to electric lighting. But when he used electric lighting, it still needed to be complemented in union with the daylighting. So on the left is a picture with electric lighting off, and on the right with electric lighting on. Where you normally would have your dark corners, you find they're illuminated. They become lighter and lighter. Just a complete reversal. And look at this. You then look at the lower level, and you walk along the roof, and you see there are skylights everywhere. And you come in down below, and you come into the chapel, and you see what he's doing with the skylights. And beautiful, just straight overhead, skylight daylighting of inner chapels and downstairs offices. Well, where do we go from here, as I begin to wrap this up now? Well, let's, let's do something here. Let's look at a site right here. This is in a development called Desert Mountain, 8,000-acre development being planned by Taliesin. It's at the very north end of Scottsdale, Arizona, right now. And right spanning across here, starting here, spanning across here, jumping across here, and going along there will be that. Now, we were talking, actually, uh, sort of informally, Bob and I were talking, and he mentioned that one of the criticisms that some architectural historians like to make about Wright is he was sort of old-fashioned. Well, let us look at this design, because this design has now been purchased, and it looks like that hotel is going to be built. But this design was done in 1926. So let's look a little bit more at the 1926 design, which I hope in three to five years from now you're going to see realized. This is the San Marcos in the Desert Hotel. It's the very hotel design that Wright did that brought him to Arizona, the very hotel design that he couldn't build because of the stock market crash. And now it looks like it will finally get built. And one requirement of those of us who are doing the engineering on it now is we cannot change the way it looks. This is a Frank Lloyd Wright original. Outside and inside, lots of glass. We're going to have to deal with the glass and the shading very, very carefully. We can use new glazing technologies that will help us, and we will realize it. So it's sort of wonderful to say, where do we go from here? And I would say, look at the future. I hope in three to five years, you're going to see a beautiful new building that was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. There are a number of unbuilt Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. I showed you the Rogers Lacey Hotel. I showed you the Lenkirk Electric Office Building. Unbuilt buildings that would be absolutely suitable to build today. And I hope and expect that we will see them built. So where we go in the future is to continue to build these buildings. And the reason we can is they are absolutely timeless. Well, there's something else that's timeless. I told you at the beginning I'd come back to residence a little bit. I can't go into residences in, in any detail now. I haven't even used the word organic, organic architecture that Mr. Wright, his definition of his own work. We had a kind of interesting discussion at supper about how do you define organic. And I guess we all agreed that nobody could really define it, including Wright himself. Except that Wright felt that he did define organic architecture by saying, just look at my buildings. Now, there's another whole side to my sabbatical work, which will deal with daylighting in residences. But all I want to do right now is flash a number of pairs of pictures before you, let you draw your own conclusions as to what organic architecture means, let you draw your own conclusions as to how Wright uses daylighting inside his residential designs.
I'm not going to describe features, but I would hope now as you look at the glass and the placement and so on, you will now begin to see things that I have shown you, that you've seen him develop in his other building designs. Where it is, how he uses the surfaces, how he uses balcony floors as light shells, how he uses the undersides of overhangs as ways to diffuse and project the daylight to the interiors. In case you would like a complete set of these slides, I own the Kaufman book. I took the Kaufman book out in the sun a few days ago, and I snapped every one of these pictures out of the illustrations of the Kaufman book so I could show them to you. So you can own every one of these by buying the new book by Kaufman called Falling Water, and you can make your own slides the way I did, by going outside and put in Kodachrome 64, hand hold it if you want to, and shoot a 250th of a second at F11, F8, and you will get what I'm showing you. So it's really quite easy to get a lot of these pictures. Windows opening outward. Some things didn't change over 60 years. And some things didn't change because they didn't need to change. I started out by saying that my inspiration for doing as much work as I'm doing on Frank Lloyd Wright is a sense of awe, maybe to the point of a sense of reverence, although that sounds like almost a, an overstatement. But a man whose architecture is not old-fashioned, a man whose architecture is in many ways still ahead of its time, a man whose architecture is still teaching us lessons now as to how we can design buildings for ourselves to live in them and for the climate, how we can design buildings where the outside and the inside speak to one another, where we can get that experience. A man whose architecture is timeless, and it's been a great treat for me to share this with you. Thank you.